Throughout the centuries, there have been many mysteries and discoveries that have left us mystified as they appear to be completely inexplicable. Though some cases are eventually solved or explained away, there are certain mysteries that will seemingly forever remain unsolved. Number 5 In 1980, Cynthia Cindy Anderson, a 20-year-old woman from Ohio, was suffering from a series of recurring nightmares in which she would open her front door to a male acquaintance only to have him force her from her house and end her life. In the attorney's office where she worked, it was well known that thanks to her dreams, she spent the last year living in fear that someone was out to get her. It got to the point that she was afraid to sleep and her fears were only exacerbated when she discovered that someone had spray painted the words, I love you Cindy, onto a wall that was visible from her desk at work. After the graffiti was painted over, the message would reappear again a few days later with the addition of the initials CJ plus CW. Cindy's middle name was Jane but she didn't know who CW might be, and she feared that she may be dealing with a stalker. To worsen matters, she started receiving terrifying phone calls while at work, and although she didn't tell anyone what was said, one of the law firm's clients witnessed the fear on her face during one of these calls. Due to her anxiety, Cindy had asked her employers to install a buzzer at her desk, which was connected to the business next to the law firm so that she could alert them if she was in trouble. This seems to have calmed her nerves a little, but she always kept the office doors locked just in case. On August the 4th, 1981, Jim Rabbit and Jay Feldstein, who were lawyers at the firm, returned from lunch to find the office doors locked and with Cindy nowhere to be found. They called out to her but got no response and when they noticed that the romance novel she'd been reading was open on her desk, at a passage where a woman was kidnapped at knife point, they suspected something was wrong. Police were called and they found Cindy's wallet and car keys were missing, though her car was still parked outside the office and there was no sign of a struggle. Her bank account, which held a substantial amount of money, had never shown any activity and her social security number has never shown up at any other workplace. A month after her disappearance, police received a call from a woman who said Cindy was being held in the basement of a white house. The woman spoke in low whispers stating that she was afraid and that the house is one of two white houses located next to each other. Police searched for the location but found it impossible to narrow the lead down to any specific house. Despite an extensive search carried out by police, aided by her friends and family, and a reward of $10,000 being offered for information, no trace of Cindy has ever been found. Number 4 The Mary Celeste was a 282-ton sailing ship with a troubled past. It was originally named Amazon but was rechristened after its captain passed away from a sudden illness and it collided with another vessel in the English Channel. On the 7th of November, 1872, the Mary Celeste set sail from New York. The ship was being captained by Benjamin S. Briggs and he was accompanied by his wife Sarah, their two-year-old daughter Sophia, and a total of eight crew members. They were carrying a cargo of 1,700 barrels of crude alcohol, which would be unloaded upon their arrival. On December the 5th, less than a month after Briggs had set sail, a passing British ship called De Gratia happened upon the Mary Celeste about 400 miles east of the Azores in the Macaronesia region of the North Atlantic. They noticed that the ship was at full sail but seemed to be adrift. They decided to board the ship for closer inspection and found that neither the captain nor his family or any of the crew was on board. They noticed that the hold had taken on a few feet of water and that one of the lifeboats was missing. 
The ship didn't seem to have taken any damage of any kind, and it was stocked with enough food and water to last for six months. The last entry in the ship's logbook noted that they were in view of the Azores island of Santa Maria, 500 miles from the area in which the De Gratia would happen upon her nine days later. Briggs, his family members, and the crew of the Mary Celeste were never found, and their disappearance is one that may remain a mystery forever. Number 3 Gunter Stoll from Germany was an unemployed food engineer who, in 1984, had been showing increasingly paranoid behavior. He'd been regularly speaking to his wife about, quote, them, unknown people who he was convinced were out to harm him. At around 11 p.m. on the evening of the 25th of October, he'd once again mentioned them to his wife when he suddenly exclaimed, now I've got it. He grabbed a piece of paper and wrote down six letters, Y-O-G-T-Z-E. Shortly after scribbling down the letters, he left his house and went to his favorite bar, located in Wilsdorf. Once at the bar, he ordered a beer and promptly fell to the ground, causing an injury to his face. Witnesses would later state that he was not under the influence and he just suddenly passed out. When he woke up, he climbed into his Volkswagen Golf and, at around 1 a.m., drove to a town where he grew up. There, he visited with the woman who he knew from his childhood and spoke to her of a horrible incident. But the woman told him to go and talk to his parents at their home instead, as it was already very late, and so he left. At 3 a.m., two truck drivers found Stoll's car in a trench by the side of the road, 60 miles away. They would later tell police that they saw an injured man wearing a white jacket walking near the vehicle. They contacted police and inspected the car, where they found Stoll severely injured and naked. He told them that four men had been with him, but they'd run away. When asked whether the men were friends of his, he replied that they weren't, but before they could get any more information, he was taken away to a hospital and passed away on the way. An investigator later revealed that Stoll had been injured before crashing his car, and almost certainly while he was undressed. Other witnesses described seeing a hitchhiker in the area, but neither the hitchhiker nor the person in the white jacket has ever been identified. Many people have tried to unravel the mystery of the YOGTZE note and the mysterious way in which Stoll died but his strange death remains unsolved to this day. Number 2 In 1908, Italian archaeologist Luigi Pernier discovered a disc of fired clay containing 242 symbols at the Minoan Palace of Festus in central Crete. It's believed that the disc dates back to the Middle or Late Minoan Bronze Age, around 1700 BC. The Minoans were a civilization that lived in the area that we now know as Greece, with the city of Phaestos being one of their most important. Little more is known about the Minoans, and so every discovery relating to them is considered extremely important. It is known, however, that the Minoans had a written language that is believed to have influenced the modern Greek alphabet, but we're unable to read it and the symbols that are stamped into the Festus disc predate even the examples that we have of their written language. It is therefore believed that these symbols may represent one of the earliest known examples of a writing system in Europe and all of Western civilization. Each of the complex symbols was stamped into the clay disc before it was fired and hardened, implying that other discs may exist since the Minoans made use of these stamps, though no others have been found to date. Most archaeologists agree with the early writing system theory, though no one agrees on how it's meant to be read. Some theorize that the spiraling symbols should be read from the outside rim to the center while others argued that they should be read from the middle outwards. As for the meaning of the symbols, some believe that they are pictographs that represent the entire world, 
similar to the Egyptian hieroglyphics. Others believe that they are a form of alphabet. The most popular theory is that each symbol represents a sound or a syllable that forms words when grouped together. Despite the best efforts of many archaeologists and scholars, it seems unlikely that we will ever find out what the disc actually means. Number 1 Thomas J. Beale was a 19th century explorer who arrived in the town of Lynchburg, Virginia in 1820. He checked into the Washington Hotel and he was described by the owner, Robert Morris, as about 6 feet in height with black eyes and longish hair. He seemed like a strong man who was used to being active and seemed to spend a lot of time outside as he had a tan and he thought him to be the most handsome man he had ever seen. Beale would spend the rest of the winter in Lynchburg, but despite being immensely popular, never spoke about his past or his reason for being there. At the end of March, he left as quickly as he had arrived. He would return two years later and again spend the winter there, leaving in the spring, but this time, he left a locked iron box with Morris. He said that the box contained valuable papers and asked Morris to keep it safe until he returned. Buell would, however, never return to Lynchburg and in fact, he was never seen or heard from again. 23 years later, Morris decided to open the box and found a note inside, written by Beale and accompanied by three sheets filled with numbers. The note explained that three years before he arrived in town, Beale and 29 other people had discovered a cleft of rocks containing gold while searching for buffalo north of Santa Fe. For 18 months, they gathered the gold and some silver they found nearby. They agreed to move their find to a secure location in Virginia, trading some of the gold for jewels to reduce the treasure's weight. In 1820, Beale decided to travel to Lynchburg and buried the treasure there, returning later to add more gold. He and his companions decided that Morris should be given the box with instructions in case they were unable to retrieve the treasure later. The three sheets containing numbers were an encrypted description of the treasure and its location, as well as a list of relatives who were to receive the bounty in case Beale and his friends met an untimely death. The note stated that a third party would post the key to the encryption to Morris, but this never happened. In 1862, Morris knew that he didn't have long to live and gave the ciphers to a friend who published them, causing another man to crack the second cipher which described the treasure as 2,921 pounds of gold, 5,100 pounds of silver, and $1.5 million worth of jewels. The remaining two ciphers have never been cracked. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.